This is a day that the Lord has made. Let's rejoice and be glad in it. I am so glad that you've come to join us for worship. My name is Keith. I am the lead pastor here. And as we come before God, we can expect that he can give us guidance and strength in the trials that we're having, the challenges in our life. And, you know, if this is your first time here, I want to encourage you to fill out the digital visitor's card so that we can better minister to your needs. Also, you can text us at 805-330-3744. Well, I think it's time for us to get into God's Word and to worship, so let's jump into it right now. Good morning, everybody. Uh, we hope you guys are comfy in your couches, and uh, we pray uh, this morning, Lord, uh, that you would be honored and glorified, that you would be enthroned upon the praises of your people, that as this worship goes out, into our homes, through our televisions, through our sound bars, our HD stereos, whatever the case may be, Lord, that you would be honored and lifted up and that your fragrance would fill our homes. Be praised, be honored, in Jesus' name, amen. God is a lamb, the lamb that was 
for the sins of the world. His blood breaks the chains, and every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb. Oh, every knee will bow before you, Lord.
goodness this morning. We pray that as we worshiped you, that you'd have been enthroned upon the praises of your people. And so we want to sing of how good you are to us this morning. Hi, we are so glad you are joining us today. I'm Brandon, the associate pastor here, and we are in our series, Enduring Hope. We're talking with you about our eternal rewards today, how we can endure trials, hardship, persecution. Well, knowing there's a reward for us for obeying God and doing the right thing, even when it's hard, that just brings a lot of security and just encouragement. And so as we jump in, I want to share with you guys a uh, 
quote by one of the guys I I look up to a lot, C.S. Lewis shares with us, it would seem that our Lord finds our desires not too strong, but too weak. We are half-hearted creatures fooling about with drink, lust, and ambition when infinite joy is offered to us. He goes on saying, like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at the sea. We are far too easily pleased. Wouldn't you agree? I know in this time that we're in right now, it is so clear that I am so easily pleased. I settle for the snooze button in the morning instead of getting up when I planned. I settle for a convenient food that tastes good instead of sticking to the diet that I've agreed I need to stick to. I've settled more often than not to one more episode on Netflix instead of turning the TV off when I already decided I was only going to watch one more episode. We are a people who are easily pleased. Earthly pleasures continue to entice, distract us from the eternal purpose God has for us. And when that happens, we sacrifice an eternal treasure and an eternal reward. Paul wanted us to know this. In the second chapter of Ephesians, he's explaining the explicitly clear gospel. We are saved by grace alone, through faith alone. He says, for by grace you've been saved through faith. It's not of works so that no one may boast. It's the free gift of God. And then he goes on after sharing the, that truth in verse 8 and 9. And in verse 10 he says, For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, that we should walk in them. The image he continues to write with is to show us it's a grace gospel. It's not a works gospel. It's not a religion that you need to do these things to earn God's love. God loves you, and by his grace, he saved you and given you faith to believe that it's a free gift. Now you've been saved by a faith that works. You've been saved to obey God. What a wonderful picture he shares with us in that clear gospel verse. For those of you who've yet to have your security and safety in Jesus, may you think on that verse today. For those that have trusted in Jesus and hold tight to that hope that will endure no matter what, we have this promise that Jesus continues to share with his followers. And one of his disciples, Matthew, writes these words in chapter 5, verse 11 through 12. Blessed are you when others revile you, persecute you, and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. And he goes on and says, Rejoice, be glad, for your reward, for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets, who were before you. So he mentions that the way that the world treated prophets and the way the world's going to treat those who claim to follow Jesus, we count ourselves blessed. And we rejoice because we know that this earth and the pleasures here, even though we're easily pleased, aren't all there is. There's more. There's a better reward waiting for those who are faithful. We see that in the next few minutes today, as we look at God's word, we're going to see the opportunity we have to fix our eyes on Jesus, the security that gives us now as we look forward to this day when we will be given the rewards for being faithful to do the work God has called and equipped us to do. So we're talking about this reward. Well, when we're rewards are given out, there's usually a ceremony and, and that's exactly what's going to take place. So when will this ceremony take place? The ceremony will take place after the rapture. The rapture is what's called uh, when Jesus comes and takes up his church. So the saints who've died believing in Jesus will be risen first and join those who are alive and believing in Jesus and they'll be taken up uh, to, to heaven. And it's mentioned, Paul mentions it in 1 Thessalonians. Um, and that will take place bringing the believers to Christ's throne where Christ's glory will reveal the works of the saints. We read about this Also in Matthew chapter 16, verse 27, for the Son of Man is going to come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and then he will repay each person according to what he has done. Secondly, we see in Revelation 22, verse 12, Jesus again speaking here says, look, I am coming soon, bringing my reward with me to repay all people according to their deeds. It's interesting, so much of what we hear current 
currently in modern day is, hey, just believe in Jesus, it's all good. Jesus is saying, yeah, believe in me, but no, I'm coming soon, and I'm bringing a reward for those who are doing the work I've left you to do. I'm going to repay you the, for the deeds you're, you're doing. These verses show us explicitly that we need to be aware of what God has called us to do and be sure to do it. Paul wants us to see this clearly, and he writes to the church in Corinth in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 11 through 15. Open your Bibles if you have them uh, with you. If not, you could grab a phone and go to our YouVersion Bible app. We have the notes in there as well. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 11 through 15, we see the Apostle Paul using a construction analogy. Us on the Central Coast, seems like we're always up and down with construction, and there's different building materials you use when, when building, and you can use uh, wood or stone, and, and Paul compares the two. And so if, as you've hopefully opened to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, we're going to jump in at verse 11. He says this, For no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Which, he goes on to say, Now if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, or straw, He says, each one's work will become manifest for the day will disclose it because it will be revealed by the fire and the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. The fire meaning God's glory through Jesus Christ when we're in his presence, his glory is going to reveal and literally burn up anything that was done not for God, that was done for for yourself. Verse 14, he, he goes on explaining, if the work that anyone has built on the foundation survives, he will receive a reward. Again, this talk and communication about a reward being given to those who are faithful at God's work. If anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved, but only as through the fire. We see here the clear teaching that the believer, by believing in Jesus, that determines your destination. But the time on this earth If you choose to obey God, well, that will determine if you receive a reward or not. So we see, as a believer, we don't need to fear a judgment based on the fact that we're sinners or not. We've already been saved, but we have the question remaining. Will we be faithful with the work God has given us to do? There are two ways to build a house. There are two ways to build a building, materially speaking. One way was to use gold, silver, precious stone, and the other Paul shares the contrasting materials of wood, hay, and straw. He, we see this observation taken that gold, silver, and costly stone are the things that God himself put into the earth. In man, the only thing we can do is retrieve and use the bounty and the purpose that God had intended for those provisions already provided by God. However, the wood, hay, and stubble, those refer to the things that men has to plant, cultivate, harvest, and then we take these resources and we use them according to our will. Really, I've been convicted by the amount of technology and the screens and the ways that we, we use things that, yeah, they're, they can be used for good or evil, but really when you look at how Paul's using this analogy, there's two very clear differences between the materials he lays out before us. So there's a suggestion that we make is that God permitted to do in and through God's children through the gold, silver, and costly stones that contrasts the individual by his own power, his own glory, his own pursuits and plans to build his own kingdom, he uses the wood, hay, and stubble. And when wood, hay, and stubble comes in contact with a fire or an ember, it catches fire. In contrast to gold, silver, and precious stone, those don't catch fire. And we have all heard stories and seen the the olden towns that just with an ember would catch a blaze quickly and burn to the ground because their sidewalks and buildings were built with pine. It's a great illustration. It's a great analogy. It helps us see the stark reality that we won't go to heaven and see St. Peter by the pearly gates asking us and high-fiving us who and by what means we should be allowed into heaven, who we know. No, this is different. This is you walk into a judgment seat, you're experiencing the glory of Jesus permeating the the materials that you chose to build your life, so to speak, 
and, and, and they're being revealed and, and, the, and the veil is being pulled back and now we're seeing who we really are. Well, I don't want to just close the book and walk away unchanged. So oftentimes I come up with a rhyme that helps me memorize these truths. And my wife oftentimes laughs at some of them because uh, sometimes they are a little silly, but you guys are in luck. I have a good one for you today. So say it along with me. Kids, if you're at home, I invite you to say it along with me. Maybe help your parents out. We're going to say this together. So doing our work man's way ensures our rewards will fade away. Doing our work man's way ensures our rewards will fade away. But doing our work God's way, well, it ensures our work will forever stay. That is the confidence, that is the hope that will endure no matter what trial or challenge we may face as believers. In this life, we know that if we do our work God's way, it ensures our work will forever stay. What exactly is God's way, you may be asking? Well, let me share with you a story of how a dad interacted with his daughter to give us a picture of how our Heavenly Father interacts with us. But before we do, I want to share with you this simple truth that God's Word tells us what to do, but God's Spirit empowers us to do it. God's Word tells us what to do, but God's Spirit empowers us to do it. So as we see in this story There's a dad who takes his daughter to a a playground near their house when she was a toddler. And as they're hanging out, he sees an ice cream man walk up and he goes over and buys the ice cream and turns and sees his daughter has shoved sand in her mouth. She has a mouth full of sand and it's gross. It's all nasty. And he looks at her. Now, do you think that dad looked at his daughter and did not love her? No. No. The dad looked at his daughter and loved her even more because it's, her, it's his daughter and she's in need. And do you think that dad looked at his daughter and, and said, you know what, that's a bummer for you. You chose that horrible decision. You replaced a good thing with a, a bad thing and now I get two ice creams and you get sand in your mouth? No, the dad quickly embraced his daughter, identifying the situation, loving her as she is, but not okay He was not okay leaving her that way. The dad loved her the way she is, but would not be content leaving her that way. He picks her up in his arms, embraces her, brings her over to the drinking fountain, and begins to wash the sand out of her mouth. Now, the dad is similar to our Heavenly Father, who brings us over and cleanses us from immorality, dishonesty, greed, pride, bitterness, bigotry, um, prejudice, bitterness, envy, strife, but we often don't enjoy this cleansing. Oftentimes, we, we reject it, we refuse it, and we say, no, I don't want this, stop, this doesn't feel good, and sometimes we stomp and throw a fit and shout and say, I can eat dirt if I want to, and you're right, you can. You, you can turn this off and go eat dirt and watch whatever you want. Uh, inappropriate things on the internet. You could do that. You can. But you're refusing to receive the blessing and the reward that God has planned to give you. That God has chosen to give you. you. You would rather put sand in your mouth than receive the blessing of the Lord. And if we do, the loss is yours and the loss is mine every time. And God is left there still loving us, trying to embrace, trying to help trying to save. And God's offer is always better. So Christian, friend, brother, sister, where is your reward? Is it in heaven or is it on earth? Because God's word teaches us what to do, but we oftentimes, we can't do it. No matter how strong or how self-disciplined we are, we need God's spirit to empower us to do it. So what are these rewards we're talking about? Well, I want to share with you the rewards that we're talking about. The first one being the victor's crown. It's self-discipline. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 25-27. through 27, Every athlete exercises self-control in all things they do to receive a perishable wreath. But we, an imperishable. So this victor's crown talks about Paul sharing with the church in Corinth. He says, look, we see athletes exercising self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath. 
but we an imperishable. This is uh, referring to an Olympic-style games that would go on for about 10 months. And at the end, they'd have this awards ceremony where they would be rewarding those athletes who won. And he goes on to say, look, I am conscious of how I live my life because I don't want to be disqualified as a worker for God. I want to receive the victor's crown. I have to have self-discipline. This is it. Self-discipline is what Paul's talking about here. He's saying, like, he's echoing the words of Elbert Hubbard, who's, who writes, self-discipline is the ability to do what you should do, when you should do it, whether you feel like it or not. Paul is saying, sometimes I don't feel like doing the right thing, but I know I need to do it, and I know I have the Holy Spirit to help me do it because there's a great reward waiting for me because I want to see sinners meet Jesus and become saints. Even though I don't want to exercise, I want to hit the snooze button and keep sleeping. The Holy Spirit will get you out of bed. Even though I don't want to eat well oftentimes, the Holy Spirit will keep me committed and, and, and following through with my diet instead of eating desserts that are so sweet. And even though I can be so easily pleased. We see the next crown, the crown of rejoicing. This crown is talking about leading people to Christ. Paul writes to the church in Thessalonica in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 19, For what is our hope or joy or crown of boasting before our Lord Jesus at his coming? Is it not you? The crown of rejoicing, the crown of boasting is talking about those who come to know Christ. And each one of you often times have a role to play. But oftentimes you don't see your role play out. You're not all Billy Grahams and you're not all evangelists seeing thousands and hundreds and, and fives and tens come to know Christ. Oftentimes you're having a conversation with a friend, a family member, a coworker, and you don't know how that seed's going to be watered by somebody else and, and, and the sun's going to shine, but ultimately God causes the growth and you're just one person out of about seven and a half is what they average before that person trusts in Jesus. So there's a crown of rejoicing that's still waiting for those who help others come to know Christ. So we have work still to be done as we keep this crown in mind. The next crown is the crown of righteousness. This crown of righteousness is talking about this idea of the righteous, remaining righteous, and anticipating the righteous one, Jesus, coming to get us. So this crown of righteousness, Paul's talking to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 8, and this is the last writing, we believe, before he was killed. He's in prison, in chains, he's in isolation, and he's writing these words. His eyes are fixed on heaven, and he's saying, henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of, of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. The anticipation. Psychologists look at this idea of anticipation, and, and they look at it as this amazing thing that promotes just positivity and, and even healing. This anticipation, Paul's saying, look, I'm in prisons. I should be depressed by all accounts. I should be so suicidal, but I'm not. I'm waiting for Jesus to come get me. That's the crown of righteousness that we all as believers should wait for. There was a gardener who took care of an estate and took care of the garden for over 20 years for this, this just beautiful garden. And this tourist shows up and they're talking and he hears he's been working there for over 20 years and he inquires, he says, so who, who's the owner? And he's like, I can't tell you that. And he goes, okay, well, how often does the owner come and check out all that you do here? And he says, in all of my time here, he's been here twice in over 20 years. And the tourist is amazed, and he says, wow, in over 20 years, the owner's only been here to enjoy this twice, and yet you consistently keep it ready for him as if you expect him to come tomorrow. And he shakes his head, and he says, no, no, I don't expect him to come tomorrow I expect him to come today. Isn't that true, believer? Shouldn't we be expecting and hoping that Jesus would come when we're sharing the gospel, when we're, when we're having self-discipline and controlling our body, even though we can do good things, we know the work he's called us to, and we're faithful to do it, waiting, anticipating his return. This next crown I want to tell you about is the crown of life. The crown of life, this one refers to the believer and their need to endure and overcome temptation and trials to the end. 
we see two verses. The first verse I want to share with you is James 1, verse 12. This is Jesus' half-brother, James. He's telling us that blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial. Man, James likes to know how to, to just ease in slow. No, he doesn't. He comes in swinging. He throws us a heavy one here. He says, blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial. How many of us are freaking out right now because buildings that, that used to house the church are no longer having their doors open? The church is still alive. The church is still moving. Jesus said the gates of Hades will not prevail against his church. The gospel is going forth through his church but blessed is the man who stays, who remains steadfast under trial. We are the church, and we have an opportunity to shine lights in our neighborhood, in our communities. Even though we can't gather in a building, we can still talk on Zoom and make phone calls and even do some, some visits one-on-one -on -one and, and be socially distancing. But we have an opportunity when we have stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised those who love him which God has promised those who love him. Again, in Revelation chapter 2, verse 10, we see this. We need to be faithful unto death, and I'll give you the crown of life. Revelation 2.10. He's talking here about the fact that the devil's actually going to come against believers and put some in prison, and he, go, and he concludes with, hey, you've got to be faithful. Okay, we're in a time right now where it's challenging, but it's not. It's not comparable to what our brothers and sisters are facing all over the world. Persecution is more present now than ever before. 100% of Christians in 21 countries, 21 countries around the world, face extreme persecution. Nearly 1 in 12 Christians today live in an area or a cult culture where Christianity is illegal, forbidden, and punished. Even now, Persecution in Mexico, Russia, and the, and the U.S. has continued to increase where we see the public square and discourse pushing faith out and silencing those who claim to follow Christ. This should not surprise us, believer. We know this is coming. We saw it when church started. We saw it when the gospel came and saved thousands on the day of Pentecost and God added them to their number of thousands, and the church began and it spread, and they, they, they were forced to go into homes and go underground, but the church continued to grow. And Paul was telling Timothy, hey, as a young pastor, here's what you can expect. Everyone who desires to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. It's a guarantee. And so we have to have this perspective of this eternal reward, eternal security with that reward. We're not investing it in the stock market, no. We are investing it in God's kingdom for his glory and our good. I want to share with you this last crown, the crown of glory. This is talking about an encouraging, and it's a shout out to all of the spiritual leaders. 1 Peter 5, verse 1 through 4 is, is, is what Peter shares about the elders and the fellow elders and those who are suffering in Christ. We're picking it up in verse 2, where we see that the crown of glory is discussed, the shepherd that we're called the shepherd, the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion. This isn't a weight like Paul was talking about in Ephesians 2, 10. This is a joy that we should be willing as God would have you. God would give you, call you to serve his body, his sheep this way. As God would have you, not for shameful gain. Don't be taking money. Don't be looking it around and going, hey, look at me, I'm doing all this great work. It's not for shameful gain, but eagerly. We're supposed to be loving it, leaning in, eagerly trying to help grow the church, not domineering over those in your charge, being humble, but being examples to the flock, meaning discipling others, building others up, equipping others. Whenever you're leading a ministry, have someone you're training up younger than you, under you to take over when God calls you to go somewhere else. It's always a moving church. And when the chief shepherd appears because he's coming soon, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. Amen? When we are faithful and he comes, we have an unfading crown of glory awaiting us. One of my favorite pastors, Charles Spurgeon, says, rewards are not of debt. We don't have a debt that Jesus is giving us. There's, there's a great such a great debt that we owe him we could never repay. And he doesn't owe us anything. 
It's a grace reward. He says, rewards are not of debt, but of grace. Shall be given to the most obscure and unknown of you, who for his sake have sought to teach little children or to reclaim the adult who had fallen into sin. But take courage. Your work of faith and labor of love are not in vain in the Lord and will do wonders yet of his grace. His grace is working through you. His Spirit is empowering you. As you read God's Word, you'll be taught what to do, and the Holy Spirit will empower you to do it. Brother and sister in Christ, I want to encourage you. We're talking about rewards today. Because today, we need to have an eternal perspective. Why rewards matter? Because there's younger brothers and sisters that need our wisdom and our example. There's There's a need now, even in this mandatory isolation, to look to Christ and to pray and say, okay, I know what I should do. Holy Spirit, help me understand how to do it. How should we do this? There's devices that have helped, but there's also devices that have become vices in our lives. And maybe we need to refocus and reorganize our schedule in, in, in who we spend our time with and how we spend our time. Maybe there's some hobbies that we've just spent too much time and that's become wood, hay, and stubble. We get to meet Jesus face to face. He's going to go, wow, you got all these hobbies. You spent all this time on the golf course and the water surfing and, and doing these things. But look at all these people that I, I use someone else to, to lead to me because you were over here. And, and that's going to be a sad time where before we enter heaven where there's no weeping, there. I guarantee I'm going to shed a tear or two when I see the opportunities I missed laid before me in front of my Lord and Savior. And I don't want that for you. I want you to experience as many rewards and and rewarding moments with our Lord and Savior and fellow believers that you were used to to lead to Him. And that's why we're talking about this. Some people will push back and say, whoa, 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 I don't want to talk about rewards eternally here. This is, we just love God, go to church mostly when it's convenient, but we go to church and we'll help out and things they, when you look at their life, look at their checkbook, you look at them and you go, wow, you're killing yourself. Literally. You're working seven days a week, 16, 20 hours a day, because you're trying to build up and amass this massive kingdom and rewards for you on earth, and you're content settling with a shack in heaven. And that is not okay. God encourages us and and corrects us in our view of ambition and says it's okay to have ambition just have it have ambition towards God's kingdom and eternal things when the crowns are handed out at the Greek word at the bema seat when the crowns are handed out at the judgment seat of Christ when the crowns are handed out the judgment seat of Christ we see that that Greek word bema seat is where the rewards are given. The awards are given out. The rewards are given to believers, not for our own gain and purpose, but they're to be handed over to Jesus. They're to be laid at his feet. Revelation 4 tells us that there's elders. There's this image of the, those who receive the crowns. They actually bow down and worship Jesus because it's all from Jesus. And now we receive this reward. We give it right back to Jesus. And I, for one, want to have a crown I can lay at his feet. I hate being the one guy that forgot to bring a crown to that party. And that one guy that didn't receive a crown because I was lazy on earth. That is going to be humiliating. And we end with this. Our greatest reward of all. Our greatest reward of all, as as amazing as that experience is going to be, nothing compares to Jesus. It's always been about Jesus. This whole Bible is compelled in in writing about Jesus and who he is and how he came and how he left and how he's going to come back again. And we're focusing on the fact he's coming back again because so often so many people talk about so many other things and we're so easily entertained. We're so easily pleased by not focusing on the fact he's coming again, which we end up being distracted and not focused on what he's called us to do. So we see Jesus' example out of Hebrews 12, 2. We see that Jesus, looking at Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and he's seated at the right hand of the throne of God. So in light of all this, we see Jesus' example. He endured the shame, the pain, the cross to see your name in the book of life to save you. In light of all this, what are we supposed to do? 
Jesus has done a great work for us. In response, we ought to change how we spend our time and who we spend our time with. We ought to make sure we're doing our work God's way. And I want to leave you with this. Henry Morrison was on a ship returning from Africa with his wife, and they spent 40 years on the missions field serving God. And as they were coming back, they, they saw this huge parade start to form in this, in, in this just paparazzi and cameras and lights and posters. And they remembered that, well, Theodore Roosevelt was also on the ship, and he was coming back from Africa as well, only he was there for a big game hunt. And, and, and the, the missionary, Henry Morrison, felt really discouraged and was really starting to get depressed. He's like, I spent 40 years and there's not one person who's come to welcome me and my bride back from serving God on the mission field. So they get in the taxi, they head to the motel, and as they get there, um, he still is just depressed and he's still beside himself and he can't shake it. And his wife says, you really ought not to feel that way. You signed up to be a missionary. You know the job description and and this usually doesn't come with a huge, you know, news and paparazzi and, and the parade and all that. And he's like, oh, I just feel like it's not right that God is treating us unjustly. Not one person recognizes us. So, so she says, you know, you need to go tell the Lord that. So he goes into the room, slams the door behind him. And moments later, he comes out and the door opens calmly and his countenance is completely changed. And she says, well, what changed? And Henry tells his wife, well, I I told the Lord that I felt like he was dealing unjustly to us and that I was just really discouraged that not one person came to meet us at the dock. And once I said that, I felt the Lord's hand on my shoulder and I heard him say, but you're not home yet. And friends, that is true for us as well. We know for sure that we are not home yet and there's still work to do. Will you work? using gold, silver, and costly stone? Or will you choose wood, hay, and stubble? That is left to be decided. That is left to be determined. And so as we close now, we're reminded that doing our work man's way ensures our rewards will fade away. But doing our work God's way ensures our work will forever stay. Let us pray together. God, we thank you for today. We pray that your power, your spirit, would guide us, would lead us, would give us understanding on how to do what your word teaches us to do. For your glory and the good of those who are called according to your purpose and called to trust in you as their Lord and Savior. May they believe in you now. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we're glad you're here with us, but we want to make sure you're continuing to talk about the things of God and what God is doing in your life in this season. So we have some questions here for you to talk it over with a friend, a family member, someone maybe at your house, or give someone a call. What is your motive for obeying God? Has the isolation period inspired you to use your time for God's work? In what way? And lastly, is God's work in your life a top priority? If not, what needs to change? Enjoy this response song as you reflect on who God is and what He has called you to do. God bless. jealous for me He loves like a hurricane I am a tree bending beneath the weight of His wind and mercy When all of a sudden I am unaware of these afflictions eclipsed by glory And I realize just how beautiful you are And how great your affections are for me And oh, how he loves us so Oh, how he loves us And how he loves us
like a hurricane I am a tree Bending beneath The weight of his wind and mercy When all of a sudden I am unaware of these afflictions Eclipsed by glory And a real demonstrated on the cross. Lord, you never felt the pleasure of sin, but you did feel the pain of it. On our behalf, to make us clean. So we thank you, Jesus, for your blood, for your teaching, for your instruction, and for your love. So we pray a blessing on the rest of this day, Lord, as we hang out with our families. We thank you, in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks, Pastor Brandon, for your message this morning, reminding us that we have a choice as to the quality of work we do for God. There is a day coming. Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 3.13, when our work will be shown for what it is. And Paul uses a building metaphor to encourage us to use high-quality building materials like love and truth so that we're building with the good stuff, doing it God's way. Pastor Brandon left us with a short poem to help us remember the point that Paul's making here. Doing our work man's way ensures our rewards will fade away. Doing our work God's way ensures our work will forever stay. This week in our Zoom life groups, here are the questions related to our message that we'll be discussing. Number one, what is your motive for obeying God? Secondly, has the isolation period inspired you to use your time for God's work? And in what way? And last, is God's work in your life a top priority? And if not, what needs to change? If you're not in a life group, click on the drop-down menu on the homepage at lccpaso.org and select Life Groups. Well, our hope and prayer is that we'll soon be able to gather at the church, as the church in our building. But in the meantime, here are ways that we're continuing to connect with each other 
I mentioned our Zoom life groups, which include women and men's groups. Our youth group Zoom meetings include many different age groups, and all the links for youth and kids curriculum for the month of May can be found on our homepage, lccpaso.org. I, I want to talk about watch parties, and I wanted to give a shout out to some of you who are inviting your friends and family to our live stream. Stacy, you have launched a couple watch parties inviting friends outside our area to watch. Good job. Kyle is reaching out past our youth group to some of his friends to watch. And Mike, glad to hear that uh, some of your family members in different parts of the nation are tuning in and watching. And that's the idea. Continue to be creative, invite others to watch. And another way that we are connecting with others and reaching out for your convenience, we start our live stream 10 minutes early so you can launch the watch party and then send out your invites. Okay, lccpaso.org has the links to the live stream. And here's another way that we're staying in touch and connected on our other social feeds. It includes inspirational messages. Hope you've tuned into these in the middle of the week on Instagram and Facebook with Pastors Keith and Pastor Brandon, a weekly prayer time as well. And you can stay in touch on all of our social feeds by searching at LCC Paso. And you'll notice through our social media that we take a lot of time throughout the week to pray with you and for you. And that's because we believe in a personal God who cares for us and hears and answers prayer. And that's why we pray a lot. Can we pray with you? Can we pray for you? Would you text us your prayer request at 805-330-3744? You can also fill out a digital connect card on our website at lccpaso.org or simply text WELCOME. Once again, WELCOME at 805-330-3744. You'll get a reply requesting contact information. Fill that out for us and we'll connect with you from there. And finally, thank you for your continuing faithful gifts to lccpaso.org make a difference. Your faithful giving has allowed us to reach out to help those in need to do this service via live stream. And your giving supports those on staff who keep things running and those of us reaching out to others during our time of separation. You can use the Church Center app to give. It's just a flat 25 cent processing fee instead of the higher rates most debit and credit cards charge. Final thoughts. Pastor Brandon's rhyme to help us remember the message today from 1 Corinthians 13, doing our work man's way ensures our rewards will fade away. Doing our work God's way ensures our work will forever stay. Thank you for watching. And remember, God's way of working starts with his love in us, reaching out in love to others.